Yeah, thanks. For, yeah, Christina, thank you so much for the introduction. And again, thanks everybody for being here with us uh, today. And so uh, we're gonna be talking about really a couple of things, just the testing in general. And also there's this concept called the big ball of bud. And we'll kind of introduce that if you haven't heard about it before and how to avoid that. And this is generally where quality engineering has been headed. So Harry, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself before I introduce myself? Hey everyone, uh, thanks a lot for joining us. Uh, I'm Hari, Hari Padbanabhan. I'm a quality evangelist at Harness. I am very passionate about quality engineering, uh, mentoring and helping people to get their true potential. And I've been part of a lot of transformational journey in, in engineering and, and quality in specific last was couple of decades, right? So very excited to be here. Uh, yep. Yeah, and I'm Robbie Lockman. Don't short, sell, don't short sell yourself, Hari. Hari runs all of our quality engineering organization here at Harness. So very funny, uh, in my career, most of my career, I've been a software engineer. And my very first set of nemesis was actually the quality assurance team. I used to be like, oh, these folks always make me rewrite what I did, or they don't understand the requirements. And you know, I was young and angsty. Uh, but as time came on, you know, I really started to respect the, what all quality engineering has done. And Hari has been really crucial for that. Uh, with our transformation here. I'll be talking about some very specific problems that we face uh, here at Harness. But uh, to level set, depending where you are, uh, what are we talking about today? Well, what even is a test, right? Like, you know, it's something you take in school. Like, why is it in software now? Uh, then we had to go over to Hari introduction to quality engineering. So as an engineering discipline, uh, how do you go about, A, making sure that, that quality uh, is, is kind of a focus uh, of your product? And then also boiling the ocean. Exactly. A uh, very interesting problem that happens in software development. And even more so, it happens in quality engineering. So testing. <laughs> so what, what is a test, right? So, you know, it, you might go hard back to your school days. You know, you're testing your academic knowledge or, you know, during COVID, you might get a PCR test, right? But what, what, what is a test? Um, so in, in software land or technology land, basically, you want to make sure that the features match the expectation, right? But also, it, it could be functional and non-functional requirements. And so from a software side of the house, it could be, hey, you know what, I'm making a calculator. Can it divide properly? You know, there's dozens of tests you can run to test that. But all the way to the infrastructure side, right? Like if you're making a certain change, like, hey, you know what, I want to you know, test that my machine came up. Hey, I want to test that this particular ports are open or this particular ports are closed, right? And so you're, you're basically testing functional requirements and also you're testing non-functional requirements such as scalability, robustness, security. And so testing, you know, the I'm stealing Hari's words here because Hari's you know, kind of been mentoring me. <laughs> it's that, you know, the, the requirements for what you test have always been there, right? But the methods that you've been using to test have been changing. And so there's, there's a huge push for test automation. There's a huge push for test coverage. I'll, I'll, we'll get into a little bit of that a little bit later, but basically uh, testing is just as important, right? It's building confidence into the system or functions or features that you're building. It's kind of a, a core principle of software engineering that you, you should test it, right? Like, hey, you know what? We, we, we all don't get things right the first time. And so making sure you have the confidence uh, to kind of systemically show uh, what's, uh, what's going on. Um, and going back to, did the feature max the expectation, right? So uh, this could be anywhere in the spectrum of functional and non-functional requirements. Um, and, and this could be, this is a, a very human centric problem, right? Like as humans, you know, we, we interpret things differently. And this is why the first set of nemesis, is, <laughs> that's a real word uh, in my career was the quality assurance folks. Is that, oh, you know, they didn't read the requirements. I, I didn't read the requirements probably as the product manager would say like, <laughs> you're both wrong <laughs> in this case, but um, it's really understanding that, hey, you know, how can we prove that, you know, going back to our calculator example, hey, how can we prove that we, you know, we can divide, you know, we divide by zero, we get a great square, error, right? How, how do we prove this particular thing? To making sure that, hey, systemically, did the feature max the expectation, making sure that multiple people agree uh, that, hey, this is what, what you're trying to build. And so I'll talk about a couple of different tests, right? And so depending where you fall, like in the spectrum of if you're coming from a software engineering perspective or you're coming from an infrastructure perspective uh, or, or you're coming from, let's say, a DevOps perspective, somewhere in between, kind of the, the first thing that you would do is unit tests, right? So very first, you know, the first thing you do as a professional software engineer, like out of university, uh, this is one of the first things I had to write, right? I'm like, oh, I never had to turn, you know, work in with tests <laughs> in university. But the second I stepped into the professional world, it's, you know, JUnit was, I had to write unit tests. I'm like, oh, okay. But really when you're when you're focusing on a unit test, it's really the smallest area that you can test, right? And so this is actually gonna play into the big ball of butt. 
So unit tests are very specific. They're, they're, you're, you're testing a very specific piece of functionality. So here I might be testing, you know, what happens when I divide by zero, right? You're, you're testing core functionality or, hey, I need to test specifically that a particular port is blocked. And so you're basically testing what you've changed, right? And so where, where the big ball of mud will come in, as you can see that, you know, a lot of times you're coming in the middle of a software project. You're coming in the middle of infrastructure projects. You're, you're just incrementally adding unit tests, right? And so this is a problem with feature sprawl. This is a, a problem with test sprawl, with hardware is gonna get into a little bit. But the unit test is the smallest amount of tests. This is kind of core to where the big volume will come from. Secondly would be an integration test, right? So after you know and the S fields after you check that you know your particular calculator can divide divide by zero, you get a grizzle error, uh, it's time for you to deploy it, right? Or time for you to see in the broader picture of your application or the platform. How is it handling? Uh, usually this might be more infrastructure related, right? So you're testing compensating controls. Uh, you're testing, here we go in this example to the right, it's, uh, you're, you're testing a particular shared component. Like, hey, you know what? Uh, I tested that my calculator can divide by zero, but also my calculator is behind a login. <laughs> so does the login service provide proper authentication authorization to my calculator, which I wouldn't know why you would build that, but you know, just for, for an example, and really making sure that in the broader piece of, of the puzzle is that you, know, you have the integration test. Usually it takes a little bit more of a purview, right? To, to, to know the integration test. So you're focused going from a unit test, you're focusing exactly what you were building to how does it play into the broader uh, application platform? And there's all sorts of tests out there, right? So, you know, these my oversimplified examples of unit tests and integration tests, but there's many ways to test, right? For example, if you're you know, more modern ways, you want to build confidence that your particular uh, piece of software infrastructure is robust, uh, you might run a load test, right? Or a performance test that, hey, you know, given a specific amount of load, um, and these are more modern ways of testing, right? Like, hey, you know what, part of your deployment process, you might run load for an X amount of time uh, to see what it happens to your infrastructure and application uh, versus going to a SOAP test, which is a more modern load test that you're running load for a very long extended period of time. Uh, they kind of see what goes on. And, and again, like the amount we can keep talking about different types of testing, like fuzzy testing and et cetera, and security testing, whatnot, even uh, more modern ways that uh, are such as chaos engineering or chaos tests, right? You're purposely pulling infrastructure away or purposely creating black holes. Uh, so seeing how your application will handle in these particular scenarios. And so the amount of testing uh, is always expanding, right? I asked Harry Hardy a, a very funny question. He gave me a good answer that I'm like, hey, what's after chaos engineering? You, know, you, you have your ears to the street. And he's like, you know, it, it's just a different, we, the problems that we're trying to test for have always been there. We're just having different ways of going about measuring that. Uh, and so how, so going back to how, how do we go about testing the calculator, right? So going back to the division, the, our division feature, now getting a little bit ahead of ourselves in number of types of tests there is that you know there there could be three types of bias that are just implied with your testing right so when you when you're looking at when you're testing this calculator feature uh one might be you know what who when you're looking at how valid a test is it's like who who wrote the test right a lot of times in engineering when there's business controls that you know it's there's controls for you know can the author be the enforcer of something uh, should the author be testing, be the one testing it? Not to a point, right? Like, you know, there used to be someone, if you're doing pair programming, usually the more senior engineers, the SDET or test engineer, um, is the test even valid, right? Like, how, how do you validate the test? And then also, when do you execute the test? And I, this is something that we've seen here at Harness is that, you know, our build times are getting crazy that because of this big ball of mud phenomenon that we have to be dealing with that. It's kind of a, a I would say, I, I've seen this problem um, multiple places that I've worked, I wasn't able to put my hand on it saying, oh, you know, this is, th this is actually becoming a real problem because uh, our build times have been you know, growing exponentially as we add more features, as you know, people come in and build certain incremental features. And this really leads us to the big ball of mud, right? And so what exactly is the big ball of mud? Uh, here's a, actually a distributed trace diagram, not of our application, but one I found on the internet. But uh, when dealing with modern microservices or a modern distributed system, is that you know, it's the, what I like to call the fog of development. And no one person has the entire purview. And so when, when you're building something, right, especially as a software engineer, you really focus on your module. You focus on your set of features. You're focused on your set of the, part of the application. Or in this example, you're focused on your service or services. And, and, and so a lot of times, we I've never been on a project uh, from inception. Because usually it's already started. I must have been on 12 or 13 dev teams in my career. And 
you know, I've, I've came close <laughs> to starting at inception, but I've never started at day zero or day one, right? And so usually it's, you're, you're focused on building a certain amount of infrastructure, a certain amount of uh, features, and you're, you're basically writing test cases to cover that in more modern teams, you know, th this has been more of a problem because like, oh, you know what, look, if we're going back to add a specific feature, we need to have X amount of code coverage, X amount of test coverage. Like, you know, we're relying on the quality engineering team to kind of tell us like, hey, you know, uh, make sure that you're covering this and this. But what ends up happening, uh, especially when we're going to, you know, we're building multiple times a day now. Back in my career, we build like maybe once a day, uh, deploy like once a month. Now we're doing that multiple, both multiple times a day. Is that we would run all the test cases, right? Like, hey, you know, I, I'm as a human, uh, you know, I, I knew what I wrote, I added a little bit more incrementally to the, the platform of the test suite. But as a safety program for safety stakes, we would actually execute all the test suites. Like, oh, you know, Robbie changed uh, the example I like to use, or another friend of the team uses, like, hey, if you were to, for example, like, let's say, replace the gas cap on your car, uh, you know, and you, know, you would test that the gas cap is, is secure, but you wouldn't test like every other test. So test the airbags, test the brakes. You know, you wouldn't give a barrage of tests to the car. Well, we actually do that in software. We we consistently run regression tests all the time. Saying, uh, oh, I don't know what I changed completely, but let's make sure. And you know, this is what increasing our, our build time. And this is what I, you know we like to call the big ball of mud. It's similar to another design pattern that it keeps rolling and rolling and rolling. Or you know, this might be some argument that this might be more of a strangler pattern that you should keep adding and adding and adding to. But I'm going to hand it over to my buddy Hari here talk about more of the uh, principle and profession of quality engineering and you know, what can you do to a measure and b also avoid the big ball of mud. So Hari, I'll stop hey, sharing my screen for, here. Thanks for setting it up. Yep. Uh, yeah. Give me a second. Yeah, here we go. Hey, thanks, Ravi, once again. Yeah. So, uh, Ravi has set the foundation in terms of what is the basics of testing and, and the big ball of mud. What's the perennial problem that that uh, impacts the whole of software engineering, right? So, I would like to start with quality engineering. And again, before getting into quality engineering, I want to step back and then try to uh, cover the basics on in terms of okay, what is testing, what is quality assurance, and how are the related to quality engineering or what is the difference right in by by definition testing uh, in 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 the testing phase what we would do is is a check or validate if a, a particular application or a product meets the requirements right we have a set of objectives and we check at the end of the cycle whether they meet our objectives or not and then say okay uh, it's a green a green thumbs up or not so that it can go to production for the customer usage right so testing basically just checks if the requirements are not met or not in this process, we are trying to get an answer for the question, have we built it right, right? So that, that's what we do in terms of testing, right? Whereas in quality assurance, it focuses a lot more on systems and processes uh, throughout the development life cycle, and then tries to ensure that we have the right checks and balances uh, to check whether we are building the product in the right way. Because we have requirements given, we involve in a lot of reviews, the requirements review, the design review, we have the change control processes, we would have the test cases and we have everything in place and try to ensure that we are building the product in the right way. Whereas testing, which comes in later, is ensuring that we have built the product right. right? Now, both testing and quality assurance have been fit and fine, right? For, for many, many decades, it used to meet the purpose. This was a time when we had uh, uh, the traditional development models like the uh, waterfall model, the iterative model, the spiral uh, development models. It used to be fine, although there were limitations in testing and quality assurance uh, in silos, it, it never used to be a more pronounced, right? With the advent of Agile, wherein we are moving to production a lot more frequently, uh, things started showing up its limitation, right? So people started looking at, okay, quality assurance and the testing, the way we are following is not keeping up the pace so that we can uh, meet our business objectives and go to the production much more often, right? So it ended up getting into the point wherein people started uh, saying that, okay, the software testing, as we know, is, is dead. Testing is dead. We don't need testing anymore. We don't need quotations anymore because of the limitations, right? So that's that's how the, uh, uh, the, the need for a quality engineering came into picture. 
when testing and quality assurance worked in silos and was focusing more on processes and the validations quality engineer focused a lot more on the mindset now the 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 quintessential need for quality engineering is about engineering quality right so there is a huge shift in mind, mindset in terms of ensuring that we engineer or we embed the quality processes throughout the product development life cycle i don't work in silos anymore we work with everybody uh, right from the product managers to the developers to the customer success uh, who are not right we work very closely with them and ensure that we are engineering quality at every stage and we are ensuring that we achieve the right quality with the right uh, speed and and the, and the uh, uh, frequency that we need right now if if somebody ask me to define quality engineering or come up with a statement to uh, uh, to arrive at the vision of quality engineering i would i would use the first principles principles of quality and come up with something like this right the, so the vision of quality or quality engineering is to provide utmost value to customers and be a force multiplier in the organization by establishing a culture of continuous quality right now the in the, the traditional world the continuous quality was was not a need right because uh, we used to have monthly quarterly sometimes even a yearly releases so the quality team had a lot of time to run the all the test cases all the scripts and then certify if it can go to production or not there used to be time wherein the production releases were delayed but in in the agile model we don't have that luxury right so the quality engineering had to reinvent itself or let the quality teams had to reinvent itself to arrive at the quality engineering mindset so that we achieve continuous quality now continuous quality means achieving quality at both speed and efficiency right so in today's day speed without quality or quality without speed has no relevance we cannot get into the point where in say hey i'm going to take 3 months or or a month and beyond and i'm going to run all my test cases and give a quality releases so don't ask me about time but again i'm going to give you a quality release right this wouldn't work on the other side we can we cannot even say okay i'm going to give every day release or maybe weekly release but i'm not confident about the quality none of these works right that's the that's the essence of quality engineering right quality engineering ensures that we achieve continuous quality at speed and and the efficiency yeah. the other day ravi and i were talking about the problem statements right he was asking me what is the biggest challenge slash opportunity in in quality engineering today right the the biggest challenge and both the opportunity and the challenge is is continuous quality so uh, let's assume that we have enough bandwidth to ensure that we do automate everything we empower everyone in the organization for a equitable quality ownership and we also continuously monitor and improve on the efficacy and efficiency and the effectiveness of 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 the quality engineering right uh, let's assume that this is taken care of and this itself is a bigger problem we can talk about this on a, on a different day but assume that this is taken care of we still have a perennial problem that has been plaguing the uh, quality industry for a long time right i mean i, I call them as uh, the quality blind spots right the two major blind spots that's been there and it still exists uh, but it's not been answered thoroughly right the first one is like do we know if we have uh, if if we have whatever test we have is it enough for achieving quality right we would have automated let's say tens and thousands of test cases we would have test cases both manual automation performance and all but can anybody clearly confidently say that do we have enough test cases that is good enough for us to achieve quality the answer is no i mean there are different ways of uh, optimizing it but again there has never been a clear solution on achieving this thoroughly and, and conv convincingly right the second aspect is even though we have uh, a battery of tests do we have to execute all the tests to ensure there is a good quality right uh, and, and again this holds good across all the layers of 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 uh, the testing and the test case and the test scripts that we have right for every change for every release do we have to execute all the test cases and is that the only way to achieve quality right that that's been one of the biggest problems that we have and this brings up to the topic of boiling the ocean right so if we have to ensure that we need to run all the test cases all the test scripts i mean i am assuming both a combination of manual and automation if you have to execute all of them for every change for every release then you are actually boiling the ocean right so let's take an example right let's say uh, you 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 walking by a river or a sea or or, uh, or so or the water source and you need a cup of water hot water right what would you do would you would you boil the sea or the ocean or would you take whatever water you need put them in a container and boil them right uh, if you are doing this 
then why are we doing differently in, in the testing world? Okay. Traditionally, what has been followed is you have the set of sanity and repression suit, and for every release, we need to make uh, execute all of them. Right? Is it the intelligent way? Probably not. Right? And most of us do that. Right? And, and this is at a at a release level. What about for every change? Uh, every change that can happen within a particular microservice, within a particular module, within a particular you know Java file or so. Right? If you have to make changes to it. Do we have to run all the test cases because we have embedded our PR uh, merges to execute all the test cases before it, it goes to the next uh, next step, right? So why are we doing this uh, in, in, in terms of boiling the ocean, right? Uh, and if you have to blindly follow the model, we will execute all the unit test cases, we'll execute all the component test cases, we'll execute the whole sanitary integration suit. If we have, let's say whether you're having a monorepo or a monolithic uh, architecture or a microservices architecture, uh, why are we doing things the way we have been doing, right? So I think there is a better way of ensuring that we are efficiently uh, executing the test cases without compromising on the quality risk, right? So the suggestion would, would be in terms of you know, slicing the test cases across each layer, the unit, the component, the integration system testing. Uh, and depending on the change, we would execute the test cases. Right. So, for example, let's say we have 50 engineers in an organization, and then they are making two to three uh, PR mergers every every day, and we have let's say 5,000 test cases, uh, 5,000 unit test cases, uh, and again it, it scales as we add more engineers and as we add more modules and features. Right. If we have to execute all the 5,000 or 50,000 test cases for every PR merge, and let's hypothetically say it takes around 40 to 50 minutes for each merge. That, that's a mammoth waste of uh, time, right? We would invariably spend roughly around uh, 12 man days of effort in a day to execute all, all the unit test cases for each PR merge, right? So what, what we are suggesting is, and in fact, uh, this has been one of the critical issues that has been plaguing us as well, and then slowing us down. What we are trying and, and implementing is uh, to ensure that we will be able to map uh, the change to the test case. Right, we can figure out what is the call graph based on the chain that we have, and we already have a, a test cases mapped to each of the changes at each layer. And based on the change, it intelligently picks specific test cases and only executes them, right? And, and then gets to the next level of PR merge, build, and deploy, and test, and things like that, right? So that is an intelligent way of testing because we are not boiling the ocean, but we are actually, you know, uh, taking the required amount of water in a container and boiling it and then consuming it, right? So this can happen across all the layers. Uh, at Harness, we have started with unit testing and then the constant testing, but you can start doing this at different layers. You need different solutions and approaches to solve this. But yeah, this is how we can uh, ensure that we are testing intelligently or we are embarking on an intelligent testing uh, model rather than boiling the ocean, right? Uh, coming back to the quality engineering aspects and let's say if you have to give you a playbook in terms of how to be effective uh, uh, quality engineering uh, team or how do you build quality engineering mindset in the organization, I'd say let's capture the key quality metrics, uh, the key coverage metrics and velocity metrics. Uh, be aware of the Hawthorne uh, effect wherein what we measure is what we would get as a, as a behavior from the organization, right? So focus on the critical, most important metrics. Follow the laying, layering approach, both in terms of automation, both in terms of the feature sign-off. I mean, we do this in Harness as well, wherein for every feature sign-off or every, every story that we are, we are developing, right? There is automation at each layer and we are measuring and reviewing the automation at each layer. And together we provide a sign-off. So unless a unit test or a unit UI test or API automation on the end-to-end -end automation is not done for a story or a feature, we don't provide the sign-off. So we build that right from each, each feature, each story. And then we build that layering approach all through and then we maintain it, right? Uh, automate whatever is possible. Don't just focus on the conventional uh, functional test, non-functional test, API automation, UI automation. Automate whatever is possible uh, in terms of uh, integrating, in terms of triggering the building, in terms of executing the automation, the notifications, uh, reports, dashboard, and whatnot. Try to automate as much as possible because that builds a lot more velocity. Right? Uh, in terms of uh, ensuring that our coverage is good enough and we are continuously improving on our coverage, Focus a lot on the uh, the customer found defects. We call it a CFT, whatever is leaked into production, and do a detailed uh, root cause analysis, and come up with the action items and measure improvements on these action items because that can go a long way 
in improving the coverage right because let's say when we started with a with a with a set of customers the customers also evolve the customer use cases also evolve i'm i'm mostly talking about the b2b kind of a model right so it evolves and we learn from each of the opportunity right and then we can build up our our coverage as well as build up on the risk uh, aspects of our test cases and and then we make good progress on that part right uh, monitor the non obvious metrics beyond your defect leakage beyond your test cases automation coverage focus on a lot of things that is not obvious in in general right uh, do you monitor your uh, uh, the production logs do you monitor uh, the uh, uh, the customer i mean the, the environment usage do you monitor uh, how the uh, onboarding of the customers are do we monitor the cs act because the primary objective of quality engineering team is to ensure that we make our customers uh, successful right we need to delight and and then make a customer successful and only when we look at each of the aspects we will be able to come up and, and better our uh, uh, the maturity of the organization right the shift left and shift right the quintessential approach of the quality engineering wherein we work very closely with the product managers product management team developers work with them help them to make intelligent and better testing right from the initial stage and also shift to the right which is on the customers and the customers domain understand them better right one of the example that i could give is like uh, we took the top 10 15 customers uh, scenarios we analyzed them and then we tried to build our our sanity suit and then also uh, make our test cases much more robust right so that that helped us a lot so understanding the customers their current requirements their future requirements how do they scale that that is very very important right and the last part related to the big ball of mad and intelligent testing to test, select your tests and run intelligently because that helps us to achieve efficiency and we'll be able to effectively uh, make an impact uh, in terms of the quality engineering right so that would be the typical uh, playbook i can provide any any questions yeah cool, cool thanks thanks sorry that was that was pretty informative um let me just put up the qr code there for everybody and yeah, sure. let me share my share my screen yeah if there are any questions feel free to ask them you know we just want to keep it interactive um, if possible if not it'll be me asking hard questions again <laughs> how, how i learned so So yeah, if if you want to, you know, first off, foremost, if you want to learn more, uh, feel free to give this a scan here, um, or we go to this URL, uh, this Billy URL. Um, but let's let's see if my oh, if we have any questions in the Q A area. Oh, let's see. So I can ask sorry questions. <laughs> my my old nemesis in, 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 my, in my career. Um, but yeah, I think what a conversation you and I had, which would be pretty interesting for for the you know for the for the audience to hear if they're if anyone wants to, to hear it is, uh, you know, I I, I asked uh, what what is after chaos engineering, right? You gave me such an eloquent answer. And I wish I wrote it down. It's like, hey, you know, in the testing world, uh, chaos engineering, chaos testing is probably one of the more bleeding edge or new ways of testing. I was able to bring down production services years ago without uh, Chaos Monkey. So I was like, oh, this is not a new concept for me. Services were going offline all the time <laughs> for me. So, uh, but, uh, but what would you say would be the, like kind of the next, you know, the next edge, right? Like the next generation of testing or? Yeah, I mean, uh, one thing, I, as I said, was the continuous quality and then ensuring that quality is achieved at, at all levels, right? So as and when we move the territories, right, from the uh, infrastructure that is hosted in our uh, own, own, in, own uh, labs, uh, when we move to the cloud, and then we have more pieces coming together, I think there is more surface area that's exposed, right? And that's where you have security and the and the uh, chaos testing, right? Because with with the chain that we are doing, many of many of us would go uh, to production every day or multiple times in a day. Uh, there are a lot of moving pieces, right? To ensure that, okay, I mean things are moved a lot beyond the functionality, right? I mean functionality is probably the simplest of the things to do, but if you look at the performance, look at the security, look at the uh, chaos aspects, look at the uh, infrastructure stability, I think that that's big, right? But still industry has not solved two fundamental problems which i shared right we don't know whether we have enough tests uh, that covers all our requirements and there are ways by which people have been using model based testing to come up with more test cases but again uh, we, i mean we end up using fuzzy logic to bring up test cases 
but that, that is not enough right? because if that was the case, it would be the simplest of the problem to solve. Right? The second aspect is, okay, what, what do we run? I mean, we are still scratching surfaces. We have started uh, implementing in terms of the uh, unit tests and functional tests, but we can go a long way, right? I mean, I, I know many, many organizations which has, which has probably a huge team of like 100, 200 people for of quality engineers, right? I wouldn't call it as quality engineering, but quality engineers who run tests for, for days, weeks, and months, right? I mean, that, that's, that's, a, that's the scale at which we people work. So one, look at the foundational problem, look at the environment which you're moving into, and then that just keeps evolving, right? Can we implement machine learning and then try to speed, in, speed up the process of making things more effective, right? That's where mm -hmm. things come into picture. I had a great answer. Always like very eloquent with the answers. <laughs> So we have, we have a couple of questions um, coming in the QA box here. And uh, I also put up a backup slide, which is all of Hari's work here. It's, it's another way of categorizing stuff, right? The who, what, when, where, why, um, you know, what you're testing also has importance. Um, and I think that actually plays into the first one from, uh, first question is, uh, when do we run complete, when do we run a complete test suite versus only testing the impacted code? So like, how do you know when to run that, like on that spectrum? When do you run everything versus when don't you run everything? So I give it to the master himself <laughs> for, for your, your thought of that, yeah. Right, so I mean, definitely we would need a, a, a good amount of end to end test, uh, which will take the integrations into, into consideration, right? But I, I would say if you can have a much more frequent release cycles, the need to test everything end to end uh, every time will not come into picture. Let, let's say, uh, hypothetically say if you have a, uh, the microservices model, or let's even if you have a, uh, a different model or maybe getting into the microservices model, but if you're doing frequent releases, as long as your, your architecture, again, that's what uh, Ravi was talking about, the big ball of mud, and you don't get into the big ball of mud uh, paradigm or the pattern, we can we don't have to run everything every time, right? You will still have, let's say, 10, 20% of the end-to-end uh, suit, -end depending on uh, the, uh, the product architecture you have and how, how evolve you are in terms of microservice model, but let's say the remaining 80% can still be optimized, right? Yeah, beautiful answer. Um, <clears throat> I, I'll try to take the next question here. And so the next question here was, uh, speaking in, uh, of enough uh, test coverage, um, is static analysis like Sonar Cube enough? So let me, let me take a, a stab at that question. So uh, like anything, there are, dozens of ways to test confidence um, throughout the cycle, right? So uh, this is more software engineering specific. Um, <clears throat> I, I consistently get C's and D's in Sonar Cube. I'd say C's and D's, so Sonar Cube will give you like a letter score. <laughs> I'd say C's and D's ship software because that aesthetic, a static analysis tool is just that, right? A static analysis tool, uh, understanding what the tool or the test can test for uh, it is really important. Like static analysis, you know, wouldn't take into your infrastructure into consideration. It just wouldn't. It would. It's it's focusing on non-executing code. So it's saying, oh, you know what, Robbie likes to put double parentheses instead of single parentheses. Well, you know, it's looking for stylistic things. Uh, it's looking for anything that can be checked or inferred. <clears throat> for example, there might be some basic security things like, hey, you're not the, the common one is like, hey, you're not sanitizing your inputs with a filter because there's no filter attached to this call uh, that's coming in here. So it's able to tell you certain things, but again, it's like, it's it's from a development side, sure, because static analysis is meant to run really quickly. It's meant to give you feedback, you know, in seconds, not, you know, running a, a soap test or a load test that can take a half an hour or hours, depending on how you, how you just have it set up. And so I would say, that, no, <laughs> it's not enough. Should you have it? Yes, of course, like using a static analysis tool is part of the course um, these days. So I don't know if you have any other opinion uh, on yeah. that, Hari, or not. Uh, I, I would say static analysis is important, but that would never be enough, right? Because it talks about the limitations of the code or how somebody has written a code, the code complexities. It can give us good insight, but again, it, it wouldn't cover us uh, uh, on the functional requirements on the other side, right? So it is needed, but wouldn't be enough. Great. Uh, another question here is, uh, what languages are the hardest to test on? M machine code? <laughs> <laughs> binary, <laughs> you know, I, uh, the, the beauty yeah. about Java, like, it, you know, or like, like 3GL or 4GL languages is that like the, the authors of the language, like, you know, like have a lot of like call graphing and ways of like inferring items, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll let, let you give a, so being 
being funny. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> that would be difficult to answer uh, unless I worked on yeah. uh, all possible languages. Yeah, but but I, I would say that irrespective of the languages, I think what is needed is more on the architecture and how you are layering, right? I mean the the uh, soft coupling or the hard coupling, how things are independent, the layering of of the code. I mean because you need to layer the code as well; it it cannot just be together. And and how you layer the automation that's more important. And again, since I've not worked in all possible languages, it would be difficult for me to say it. But I would say more than the language, it it has to be the architecture. It has to be the way we are layering it, right? In in the same Java language, you can probably mix uh, the code or you can layer it at different uh, uh, data structure and then make build a dependency graph and then run it in a better way, right? So I'd probably say that okay, more than the language, uh, the architecture and uh, the the patterns matter. A great, great answer there. Um, let's see. Two of these questions uh, are kind of similar uh, that that share. So um, they kind of like play. Well, actually, they might be a little bit different. So I'll, I'll take this, or I'll, I'll post this one uh, first. Is that uh, when? And this is more of a. It was more. It's more of a. I think academic question that if you're only testing a fraction, like so, like this person will say, if they're only testing what they wrote. How do they know that only changing, let's say, two modules uh, will not adversely affect something else? So this is this goes back on the, you know, you, you made a change somewhere and something else blows up. How do you validate what happens? The core said a big ball of mud. Yeah. So as long as you're not tightly integrating everything, uh, the impact will not not be there. And again, again I, I can clearly watch for this because. I also come from the uh, traditional uh, development models, wherein we used to take three months uh, of development, one month to test everything, and then push it to production. The 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 way you layer and then integrate things that can make a lot of difference, right? You may still have to run the integration and end-to-end -end test, but the unit test, the functional test, uh, that that can be uh, clearly clearly uh, called out, saying that okay, it doesn't have an impact right, on the other side, right? So if the most of the uh, approaches that we are implementing right now is on optimizing the unit test and function test. So if, if you have a microservice model, if you are ensuring that the contracts are completely integrated and tested, we, we can be uh, safe in this aspect. Cool. Uh, another question here would be... Okay. Sorry, if the another changes question are optional, yes. Cool, cool. Let's see, another question here. Uh, what would be the criteria for uh, so selecting test automation? Or a framework. So, if you were looking to bring on like Selenium or Jenkins or something like, I guess it's, I guess it's like a pro, like any. I can take a generic stab at this question. Um, how do you know that it will be viable? Like, if you pick any sort of test framework, if it's going to be a viable framework. Uh, let me let me take a stab at this first, and then um, kind of get your answer. So, it's like picking any sort of technology, right? Like, it's just taking testing out of the picture. What if you're looking to build functionality? Like, why do you pick a certain uh, provider like oh you know what I'm going to be using uh, Apache Kafka or using Cassandra or using you know some sort of Spring framework right like it, it's it's all about it's testing might be a little bit different because you're getting uh, more you know, you're getting a little bit more out of let's say building um, or more functionality than building it yourself and so one thing might be hey you know what it, would it be the generic answer would be vitality right so if you're picking something that's open source. You know, are is industry moving towards that? Are they you know, even like a, a test framework like Mocha or using like JavaScript, right? Like it's or Node. It's you know, hey, um, is it? Are people leveraging it? Is are people contributing to it? Is it is the project continuing to evolve? Right. So that could be a big detriment because again, also there can be other concerns. <laughs> but you know, because at the end of the day, like what you test, like if it's a especially if it's a uh, unit or functional test, is that the you know, it's, there's lots of ways to do it. You know, you, you, you can just test language specific. A lot of times testing suites are specific for language. Uh, looking at other frameworks, there might be, if you're doing UI tests, uh, there might be, you know, some sort of robotic stuff that's out there that it's not specific to the language. It's more specific how the software will function at the end. Um, but not sure if you have any other, you know, when you're looking to include a test package here uh, as, as a leader, like if you have anybody grind through any sort of criteria hard. Yeah, that, 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 that's a fair answer. Uh, so you basically have to choose who is the audience and what is the skill set, and also choose a language or a tool which is supported and ensure that that is highly extensible and it meets, it, it has a good community and it meets the current and future needs, right? So uh, choosing the right tool for the job is very important. And uh, of course, we all go through this kind of a, 
uh, questions, right? In terms of, okay, do we choose a Python based framework? Do we choose Java based framework? Or do we, do we choose JavaScript based framework, right? And, and depending on who the uh, audience is, and in terms of who's going to write it, their comfort and also the uh, long term objectives should be there, right? I mean, most of us have been using uh, uh, the core engineers have been using Java and Python based framework. And off late, we are trying to work on Java based framework. Again, it all depends on your team and the sustainability and uh, ensure that others can also use it when, when somebody in the team is already moved out as well, right? So if it's extensible, simple to learn and use, you have a good community support, it, is, it more or less uh, meets the need. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, I guess the, uh, the, the million dollar question here. Um, <clears throat> so, it, what, so what approaches would you suggest to run tests um, in an intelligent fashion? So like, well, what, what we do here is like, we try to map source code changes to test suites. And so I'll, I'll take a first step at that. Um, and then, you know, you can kind of correct me wrong. So pretend I'm an engineer, so I'm a, uh, engineer here, still writing, you know, day-to-day -day feature development here at Harness. Um, we're very fortunate that we, we play in JVM land uh, here at Harness, you know, going back to, hey, what languages are harder to test? So, you know, we're Java, Go, Scala, all, all that. And so we're able to generate a call graph, right? Saying, oh, you know what? This is a call diagram that we're generating when we're building something. Um, let's make sure that we have tests here, here, and here to cover these. But um, also uh, part of this problem, uh, as uh, would allude to, is that we actually are building, you know, it was such a big problem for us here at Harness uh, is that we're actually building a product that will actually that, like will actually map the call graph for you and visualize it. But um, you know, Harry, not sure what kind of direction we give day-to-day -day engineers still yeah. <laughs> when they yeah, actually so, like. So yeah. there, there are two ways to solve this problem: is one at the um, source code instrumentation, another one is the bytecode instrumentation. And again, the more we do a bytecode instrumentation, it's highly scalable. Let's say, for example, you have a uh, Java, Scala, and it uses JVM. If you could do it at a bytecode level, it's much more easier. So once you have the bytecode instrumentation and you can derive the call graph, then we'll be able to map uh, what changes and what needs to be run. Like let's say you have a, a call graph of let's say 10 nodes. And if you're making a change at the eighth node, we can safely assume that we can execute eighth and ninth and 10th nodes, right? So that way we can build that. Yeah, I, I think Ravi, I think this, this is a bigger problem for everybody in the industry. And and I think uh, we need to uh, start supporting and uh, uh, I mean, exposing the solution that we are building. Yeah, yeah, I think it's almost, almost due time. You might get a preview if you scan this QR code. This is part of my, you know, circus showmanship here. It's like, you know, there, 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 it is coming. Yeah, so we are, you know, I'm quite excited about that, but uh, you wanna- yeah, Just to highlight, to right, we are able to get anywhere between 40 to 60% of, uh, 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 time and uh, uh, effort save because it's not about just the time uh, which is based on execution but it's also the infrastructure on which we try to run we're able to get anywhere between 40 to 60 percent of savings and again this is at the initial level and we the more we optimize we can get much better at that right yeah that, that makes perfect sense so let's see uh next question here um biggest big issue many projects uh that i've worked on is unstable uh, hardware. It's hard to validate the infrastructure. Um, what would be the, the a, a good way of uh, testing the infrastructure um, before deploying? So I, I have my opinion, uh, but I want you to go first because <laughs> mine would be more aggressive. <laughs> than yours. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think the yeah, yeah. simplest of the solution is ensure that we are uh, uh, provisioning the infrastructure for both Dev and QA, the way we are provisioned in, in the production. So as long as uh, we are maintaining the same thing and, and again, we are able to run that. Of course, there will still be smaller uh, issues, but this will take care of probably 90% of the issues when we are doing the infrastructure provisioning through the core. Uh, so uh, that's that's actually embedded within our own uh, uh, development and deployment cycle. And again, we are able to provision it and then deploy our, our code and then continue with our test triggers and then result analysis. Right? Very, very uh, diplomatic answer there. <laughs> <laughs> now it's time for the aggressive answer. So, um, I, I, this just happened to me a lot, right? Like, uh, if I go back, like, golly, if I go back a decade ago, and like, this, this used to be that, you know, it, different sets of people would be provisioning like a VM, you know, it, it was more statically provisioned. So, like, very, very modern deployments today, um, it's infrastructure aware, right? So, your infrastructure is like a huge rise of infrastructure's code. Uh, and all the benefits with that and, you know, our favorite word containerization, right? Like ephemeral infrastructure, more buzzwords that 
you're able to provision the infrastructure at the time you're making the deployment. And so for those advantages, those advantages to occur, it's treated like a piece of software, right? Like, you know, you're able to specify exactly what you want, when you want it. But uh, going back to, you know, the static provisioning days that, you know, okay, it takes, like, I need to let somebody know a few days in advance, like, hey, can you bring up, you know, robbie.vm2.com? <laughs> I have an additional piece of, uh, you know, application infrastructure needs to deploy. There could be a lot, right? Because like, you know, there's not a consistent, uh, let's say, descriptor or language between uh, between the folks. And also, it, it's also hard to prove that, you know, was it the exactly what you pointed to, right? Like, was it the application that was the problem or what it, was it the infrastructure, right? Like, hey, why is it running slower now? Uh, oh, well, because in our dev and QA instances, we had a four core box in production. They gave us a two core box. I mean, it's making this up, right? There's some thread locks that are happening. We can't resolve them quickly. And so it's to making sure that you have an environmental parity. So at least a very valid point that Hari gave there, you're able to have some sort of parity between your environments. Also, you, you might just start running, you know, if, if moving completely to automated infrastructure and, you know, at or near deploy time uh, infrastructure provisioning, uh, you, you might uh, just want to run some tests, <laughs> you know, kind of every day, right? Against statically against the infrastructure that's provisioned. So that goes into the other question. I'm, I'm uh, tying into the question above it. So the other question was testing in production is like, uh, is that continuously testing? Um, is you know more of a mindset, right? Like always test, always always be testing, so like always be closing, right? Like, hey, you know, a lot of times it's more of a, I'll let Hari take the second part of the sensor, but it's very intrinsic, right? Like when I when I was deploying to production, I used to get a lot of angst because your deployments are never over. You know, you when are, when are you off the hook for changes, right? Like. Your, your next deployment starts when the other one has went in, right? And, and so just to have, making sure that you have proper monitoring in place, uh, pro proper metricing in place, uh, you know, if there's any sort of ways that you can kind of pre-execute the test suites, uh, you can do that. Uh, but uh, I'll give, I give uh, Hari back the chance for more of an academic answer. <laughs> <laughs> about yeah. uh, so and I, I'm assuming that uh, when there is a chain, we are pushing it to production and then trying to test. If that is the case, and if your uh, production infrastructure supports it, let's say you have a blue green deployment model, you are able to deploy into production and test it right there, that is continuous testing. But if the system is set in such a way that you don't do testing in your during your development uh, or when it moves from development to maybe staging and then to production, but you're only doing in production, that's not continuous testing, right? So if you're testing from the time the code has been checked in uh, through the process and also in production, that would be continuous testing. But testing only in production, not through the process, that would not mean continuous testing. Gotcha. Oh, I think we have, I think we're coming up right up time. So we have time for one more question. Um, and the last question would be when looking into optimization, what three areas to, to keep in mind? So kind of a, a wide paintbrush here, but I'll let my buddy <laughs> Hari, Hari take it home. You had three uh, things. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I would say, uh, in, in, in terms of quality effectiveness, right? I mean, we need to continuously optimize uh, the infra. And again, we have seen time and again, irrespective of what we see. Again, I, I come from a different uh, environment setup. And then in, at Harness, we have uh, continuous monitoring of the uh, cloud cost where we have hosted our uh, all the environments, QA, production, whatnot. There is very, very high uh, opportunity to optimize the cost. Then the second optimization would definitely be on, on the testing, right? Uh, what are we testing? Is it enough? Are we doing more? Uh, we, we can. We, we will be able to look at that, and the whole process of delivering the software that needs to be looked at for optimization, right? And this would probably be top three areas uh, for optimization. There can be more, but this is state of the bat in terms of where we can get immediate value. Right? Cool. I think we're. I think that's it. We're right at the top of the 50, 50 mark. So, uh, Christina, I think I think we're all set. And sorry if we couldn't get to your question. Uh, feel free to reach out to us. You know, QR code will let you. Let's know how to get in contact with us. Well, great. Thank you so much to Robbie and Hari for their time today. And thank you to all the participants who joined us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation YouTube page later today. We hope you're able to join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone.